half-baked graduates. This is probably a term that you've heard before as an employer or a young person looking for a job in the employment sector. Now, this has been a thorn in the flesh of the Kenyan education system. And even more recently, the World Bank pointed out that it is alarming the rate at which we are turning out graduates that do not have the skill components that are relevant in the job market. It is for this and many other reasons that the Kenyan government, in partnership with organizations like GIZ, are trying to bridge that skill-based gap in the job market. Now, in partnership with institutions such as TVETS, they're trying to ensure that we bridge that gap and churn out skill-based graduates with enough quality education, but also enough practical knowledge. And if it might interest you to know, the government of Kenya intends to ensure that TVET enrollment by the year 2030 is over 20%. Now, this forms the basis of our conversation today. Hello there, and welcome to another session of Come Live. My name is Indira Ganga. I am a business journalist with Metropole TV, and I'll be the moderator of the conversation today. The topic that we will be discussing is technical skills for innovation. You can always be a part of this conversation, head over online through any digital platform. The hashtag to talk to us through is youth in industry. I'm not alone. I have an able panel. From my left, introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sami Waititu. I'm the principal Kiambu Institute of Science and Technology, and currently the chairman, Kati Nairobi Region. And maybe to put into perspective, Kati Nairobi Region is one of the five regions of Kati. It covers the whole of Northeastern Province, part of Eastern Nairobi County, part of Rift Valley, and, the, and part of Kiambu. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. My name is Phyllis Wakiaga. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Good morning, everyone. Kikiri Langant, uh, Director General of TVET Authority, a uh, government agency uh, responsible for coordinating and regulating TVET, and we are also the agency representing the country in the membership of World Skills International. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maren Diala Schelschmidt. I'm the head of the German Chamber here in Eastern Africa, based in Nairobi. We are actually quite active in dual vocational training according to the German model. And on the side, I'm also the secretary of the Permanent Working Group for Vocational Training here in Kenya. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, compliments for the new year. My name is Faith Langat, and I am account manager, East Africa for Face to Didactic, and also a member of Waskis Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Festo, we are keen on uh, skills development as we manufacture the equipment that support the development of skills all over the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now, Marin, let's begin with you. Kenya recently got admitted um, into the World uh, Skills International Organization, and this is a big step. However, Germany has been a part of it for a long time. What are some of the strides or gains that Germany has made with regards to being a part of WSI, and what are some of the lessons that Kenya has learned, can learn from Germany just having been recently brought in? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, Germany is part of the World Skills since 1953, I think even a time when none of us was born, even the old people on the panel here, and uh, actually one of the six founding members. And uh, since then, uh, there's been competitions on regional, national, European, and world uh, level, and it has really helped uh, the image and the, the, the knowledge and the pride of Tibet students and Tibet education in Germany. Put in perspective, uh, you mentioned that uh, the goal of uh, Kenya is to have 20% enrolled in Tibet. In Germany, it's 50% of the youth uh, going the Tibet uh, choice. One last one thing to mention is um, one of the last visits before COVID was of the federal president of Germany here to to Kenya, and incidentally, the chairman of World Skills International was here at the same time. So uh, they they discussed also on the topic, and uh, Germany has promised to uh, support Kenya as the new one of the newest member of World Skills. So I'm really um, excited to see what will happen. Mm -hmm. 
Langat, uh, what kind of impact will Kenya, being a member of WSI, have on TVET, on, on our entrepreneurial and skill-based journey as a country? Thank you. If I may pick it from where Oren left it, uh, first, um, as a country, we decided that uh, we are going to have uh, TVET as one of the pathways for the education and training in this country. And for that reason, we wanted to make it um, implemented uh, based on the international best practice. And one of the things that we are looking at is uh, issues of uh, quality and relevant training that we have to work very closely with the industry. And one way of doing this is um, bringing the industry expertise into the training. And this is how we are going to um, implement the uh, uh, activities of the world skills where we are going to allow students and experts to uh, exchange ideas through competition and this uh, allow people to really practice what is real life um, skills as expected in the industry. In this case with the impact that is going to happen is that um, as our young people going to join the rest of the international um, colleagues in terms of competition they will be able to share um, experiences, ideas, and innovation, and they will also be able to tap into the expertise from other parts of the country, uh, uh, other parts of the world, to be able to uh, implement locally. And in that case, we will see, uh, from the perspective of the industry, uh, issues of uh, increased productivity and performance in terms of uh, businesses in the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Phyllis, you're in a sector where TVET plays a very critical role in that is manufacturing. How has that skill gap been a thorn in the flesh of the manufacturing sector and how does bridging it help us achieve, the, for example, the Big Four agenda where we were to grow manufacturing to 15% and create at least 1.3 million jobs? Um, thanks for that, Enduro. Um, as you have mentioned, skills are quite critical uh, for the job market and the manufacturing sector or industry is actually the end user of these technical skills. And since 2017, we have been implement, implementing a TVET program where we have tried to ensure that we link industry and academia and we provide opportunities for internship uh, for TVET graduates within the industry. Uh, what we are trying to do is to close the gap uh, between what is happening in school from a learning perspective but and what is happening in industry. So we've learned some key lessons uh, during this time. One of the important ones is the need to have those continuous dialogues so that we bridge the gap between what is happening in industry and what is happening uh, in education. And one way to do it is to get involved in the development of the curriculum. If industry is involved early on as curriculums are being developed, it ensures that all those industry needs are mapped within the curriculum. Uh, the other important thing is uh, to look at how we can incorporate the feedback that comes from the graduates when they are within the industries uh, in also charting forward how the TTIs and industries operate. Uh, because as the TVET graduates are placed in industry, there are some learnings, there are uh, issues that need to be addressed and gaps that need to be closed. So what we are trying to do is to map out all that and have that feedback shared with industry, shared with the TTIs, so that we are dealing with uh, any of those issues. Uh, the other thing is we've also been running a program on on CBET, which is competency-based education and training. And out of this program, it's clearly having very clear learning outcomes so that when the TVET graduates are placed in industry, it's very clear what the learning outcomes are. Uh, that makes it easier for the supervisors to monitor and for us to be able to also give feedback uh, back to the TTIs on, on the gaps that need to be closed. So the work we're doing will continuously try and address uh, that gap and bring everyone on the table to improve skills development. Mm -hmm. Sami, you work in the skill development sector because you're right into the TVET. Talk to us about the importance of tailoring the curriculum to fit the current need of the market. For example, right now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. How do we tailor the curriculum at TVET level to match that market need? Uh, thank you very much for that question. I want to say that uh, our mandate as technical training institutions is actually to impart skills on the young young men and women of this country, so that they can help us become an, in, an industrialized country, which we are not at the moment. I want to say that um, a lot has been done so far. 
but there is still a lot to be done. I want to say that um, we have been training on a curriculum that has a huge theoretical component. The challenge has been realized already in collaboration with the industry, and a lot is being done. We are coming up with the competency-based education and training, which we are referring to as TBET. And um, I believe this one is going to be a game changer so that our, our graduates come out competent and when they go to the industry, they don't require to be retrained. We have uh, come up with programs such as the TVET trade fairs where, we, where our graduates meet and ex exhibit their, their innovations. That way, we are sure that uh, they, are, they are able to mimic what is happening in the what is happening in the industry we have not we are not yet there but i believe with the seabed curriculum that is being developed and being implemented to a small extent and which is going to be accelerated with the time we are almost there Thank you, Sami. Faith, let me bring you into this. You're a member of the World Skills Council Kenya, and you're also a young person. And unemployment is a big issue in this country, 39% nationally. If you look at youth unemployment in 2019, it was about 2.64. It grew in 2020, and 7.24 for the youth, 7.27 in the year 2020. If you look at the statistics, they are worrying. However, as a young person, how do you think being a member of the World Skill Council Kenya and bridging this vocational skills gap can help us address that unemployment issue through entrepreneurship and innovation? Uh, uh, first of all, I think um, World Skills is really a timely decision for Kenya because uh, when you look at the countries that have advanced, uh, they have a very complex economy in that they manufacture very many products and also very sophisticated products. And that's not our case for our country. Our products are mainly agricultural products. So World Skills will enable the youth to tap into the innovations, uh, to tap into the innovations of other developed countries, for instance, Germany and Japan, and all the other countries that have really developed their TVET. And it also brings them together through these competitions and allow them to challenge one another so that they can come up with innovations and those innovations can lead to entrepreneurship. And once we have uh, passionate youth who are also, um, uh, who have learned from the best, they can be entrepreneur and they can also create jobs for others. Mm -hmm. So we see an expansion of jobs and also we see a diversified economy in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, Phyllis, let me come to you, a diversified economy. Where are we as a country in diversifying our economy, particularly manufacturing where we are in terms of artificial intelligence, robotics, blockchain technology? Are we diversifying enough to be able to create a market where once these people are out of the good training that they've gotten, they have opportunities in the market? My mic is now on, yes. <laughs> so I was saying that the market is, Kenya, our economy is diversified. We are not an economy that says over relies on one thing. We have manufacturing, we have technology, we have tourism. We have a very diversified economy. Within the manufacturing sector also, um, as an association, we have 14 sectors uh, within the sector that really represents the spectrum of manufacturing uh, that happens in the country. Of course, food and beverage is the largest sector because of our link to the agricultural sector. But we have other big sectors like the building, mining and construction sector, the metal and allied sector, automobile and other sectors. So in terms of uh, diversifying within manufacturing and taking advantage of opportunities, that is something that is happening but that, that can happen much more. Um, if you look at the needs in the market and you can detect this from the amount of importation into the country, there is room for us to expand significantly into other um, areas of production. Um, we also have the opportunity to expand not just to serve our own market, mm -hmm. but the ESC market and now the Africa continental food trade area has also opened up the entire African continent as an opportunity for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So we do see an opportunity for us to diversify, to make Kenya the manufacturing hub of Africa and considering we have the right skills, our people are quite skilled, uh, that's, that's something we can get into. Um, of course, there is the need to really get into the fourth industrial revolution, bringing more automation, bringing a lot more 
uh, in terms of uh, taking advantage of things like 3D printing and so many other opportunities that exist uh, within the fourth industrial revolution. So that's where we should be going and are going as a manufacturing sector to see how we can now become a globally competitive country uh, by addressing the issues around the cost and ease of doing business, but also supplying the right technology and skills to support industry to be able to diversify and get into very high technological sectors. Mm -hmm. Sami, oh, go ahead, Langat. <laughs> yeah, if I may add to that, uh, I think uh, Phyllis mentioned that um, if you look at uh, the, the, how we satisfy the, the, the local need in, in terms of uh, goods and services mm -hmm. and how much we are importing to this country, that translates into a number of jobs that we are losing by creating jobs elsewhere. And therefore, if we can uh, make uh, our manufacturing sector or um, service sector more competitive, that will allow more of these uh, goods and services manufactured locally. We are going to uh, probably provide opportunities for employment. And one of the things that uh, really critically determine how competitive we are going to be mm -hmm. is through uh, getting the right skills that will be able to impact and uh, make the probably cost of manufacturing, cost of uh, production of these services and goods more affordable, encouraging more people to come and invest here. And I think that is a key thing that we are looking at. Thanks. Sami, you have something to add? Go ahead. Uh, just to say that uh, we, are, we are moving in the right direction at mm -hmm. the moment, but um, we are not yet there. And I want to say that uh, with this co collaboration that we are having now, we are going to we are going to make a big difference. Initially, uh, there has been no real collaboration between the industry and the, and our training institutions. Mm -hmm. We have been operating independently, without the left hand knowing what the right hand is doing. And this this new uh, new way of doing things it will make us make this country what we want it to be. And you raise a very pertinent point. How can we further harness that collaboration so that different institutions have partnered with various sectors so that we know what's going on there? Uh, I think it has started, but it is good to put it into perspective. The key thing is the curriculum. We have been implementing a curriculum that we, that we sit as trainers or as educationists and agree that this is what we want to train in without asking ourselves what is the industry what is the industry looking looking for so we have been churning out so many graduates but uh, now that that has been realized there is cross collaboration the seabed curriculum is is actually being developed with the industry in mind mm -hmm. and not just in mind but with the key input of the industry mm -hmm. so it is the industry who is guiding us on what kind of skills do we need. Mm -hmm. So that way we cannot get it wrong. So we, already, we are already there, slowly by slowly, but I am sure with time we are going to, we are going to be what we want to be. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, before you come in, let me just bring in Marin. Yes, thank you. Uh, allow me from the German uh, experience to challenge what was said a little bit further, what uh, we are actually starting to to try to uh, implement here, also in cooperation with KIST and other, other centers of excellence, is the idea of dual training, which is even one step further than classic only seabed, I would say. And the, the, the idea behind it is that we did also in Germany, is that it's not only sending graduates to internships or after the training to companies, but have them in the companies throughout the training. It's a dual concept. They are employed by companies and partly trained by the TVET. Uh, there are a couple of uh, pilot projects uh, sponsored by GIZ and KFW that uh, uh, TVETA and uh, KIST and other uh, TVET institutions and also us as the German Chamber are cooperating with. But there's also, we as a chamber do our own small first dual trainings to just show it works. And the companies are committed because it's a good investment for them to have the uh, apprentices, as we call them, from the beginning involved in the company. And as uh, was said before, they are actively involved in the curriculum that we do together. 
so the, uh, the sometimes we the, we are asked where the German success story came from, and it comes from from that model. We actually have a youth unemployment rate of about five percent at the moment, yeah. even in COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I I wanted to 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 also say is um, that it's very important that there's pride in the use of doing PVET. And that's a lot of initiatives, and together with PVET and others, we have um, started campaigns to, for, the, for the image, and uh, a big part of that is the so-called Hands on the Future skills show that we uh, performed with the government, with companies, with donors, with Kibeta two times already. It unfortunately had could not take place in the COVID year 2020, but we are trying to do it again in uh, 21. And we had last time 25,000 youth and their families, which is very important, because the families are also part of the uh, decision on what career change mm -hmm. uh, path to, to choose. Mm -hmm. So they were there. And actually the idea at the moment with skills, um, work skills is to incorporate the competition partly into that exhibition to also showcase. Because work skills is a little bit the Olympics of vocational training. And it's pride and it's skills to show. And uh, this is uh, what we're trying to also establish here. Mm -hmm. Lanat, let me bring you in because Marin raises, raises a very important point. There has to be pride in going to a TIVET center or a TIVET learning institution and taking those vocational training courses. However, in this country, our pride is going to university and getting that degree. However, sometimes the, the education that we are getting is a total mismatch from the market need. We are seeing, even if you look at KCSE results and TVET placements, we are beginning to see that paradigm shift. But how do we jumpstart it and take it to the next level to ensure that we have a bigger intake at the TVET level? So we, we begin by bridging that gap through the intake. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier on, as part of the reforms that the government uh, is implementing, other than the quality and relevance of the training that uh, directly link the product of our TVET institution to the requirements of the industry, and therefore people see value in terms of going to TVET and directly contributing into the industry. The other thing was um, changing the curriculum that again, in terms of uh, working together with the industry, and actually the, the conversation is training with the industry and not for the industry. And in this case, that from the beginning of um, uh, developing a curriculum, the industry is involved through advisory committees and so forth. And then the other one was rebranding of TVET, and we have looked at this in several ways. And one of the aspects of rebranding of TVET is actually providing the skills competition because in any way where you have competitions and people uh, derive value, other than the interest that you get through the competition, you also see the output of that competition into directly uh, injecting into the economy. And this one has uh, yielded fruit. We started with the skill show, as Maren has said, where we, br we brought in uh, the stakeholders in, in, in Tibet, both in industry, the parents, and the guardians and the students themselves to start a conversation on how we make TVET uh, great again. And we have seen this. For the last three intakes, um, after KCSE, uh, from 2018, we saw close to 900, over 900, actually to be precise, 996 students who had uh, secured placement at the university changing into TVET. 2019, that rose to around 1,500. Uh, last year, the number was over 2,000. And we have seen even those people who have finished universities coming back to Tibet to acquire skills that are relevant in this. And I think the framework that we put in place in terms of making Tibet great again is yielding for it. Yeah. Faith, let me bring you in on this. Because in as much as we are talking about skills and enrolling these people, you've been there, you've seen the practical nature of these skills. How far do they go in the real world? Uh, when we talk of uh, uh, the real world, it really means that we have to really have the hand, hands-on skills yeah. that are relevant for the current industries. So for instance, in country, other countries like Germany again, I would say for instance, they, like the, most, the product that they export most is inter integrated circuits. 
uh, when you look at that product, it's a, a sophisticated product, of course. So for us to reach that level of sophistication in our products and also to gain value out of the products we export, it means we really have to really be hands-on and go to the level of really um, understanding the core skills that are required today and also stay ahead of the curve and also looking at the future and really monitoring at what is needed tomorrow in the industry. Mm -hmm. Sami, speaking of what is needed tomorrow in the industry, do you think our curriculum is competent enough to compete globally? Mm, frankly, at the moment, it is not. But then, like I said, we are working on it. We have introduced the CBET curriculum. We are now involving the industry more so that we capture exactly what is, what is required. Mm -hmm. Through that collaboration, I believe we are going to, we are going to meet the the needs of the industry and uh, be competitive in the world in the world at large. Mm -hmm. Lang Langa, do you want to add a point there? Yeah. L let me add uh, to what Simon uh, is saying about um, first is uh, one as a country when we are, as I mentioned again about reform, we, we started by looking at our um, qualification framework and first the qualification framework has to be um, comparable internationally so that when you get a qualification from this country is comparable to another qualification in another country and, and this is a, a a must because for example if we are going to ask more people to come and invest in this country in terms of um, as I, I mentioned earlier on the kind of skills that are required we should be able to provide the skills that are internationally comparable we are also looking at the in terms of creating more jobs for our youth, not only our economy, but we're also going to look at the regional and international economies. And therefore, it must force us to have uh, our education international comparison. And what we have done, first, is to create a qualification framework that is in place. Second, is to be very clear in terms of what we need to do as Chivet. We have developed a number of uh, training standards that dictate on how a curriculum is developed from inception, where the industry must be there. Then the delivery, again, the delivery we are doing together with the industry, where some of the experts come from the industry to complement our uh, experts in the training. And finally, during the examination of these students or assessment of these students, we also get the expert from the industry. Linking this to the uh, World Skills International, currently, in the last competition, which was in Russia, we had about 56 uh, skills areas. And before a skill is entered into competition, it is reviewed and, uh, and looked at whether these skills is relevant to the current or the future uh, skills. In fact, there is a thematic area of future skills, which we expect probably in the next five, 10 years, they will be in place. So as a country, joining world skills is going to put us even in more uh, advantage position in terms of operating on current requirement in terms of skills. And we want to uh, do this and directly impact the industry. And we will be, uh, um, uh, Phyllis mentioned that they review and give us a feedback. So we want to be seeing probably in the next few years, what kind of impact are we creating as a training uh, institution into the practice at the industry. Mm -hmm. And that will be able to Either we are going to review our curriculum or the delivery methods, or we are going to enhance what we currently do. Marin, I want to bring you in, in a few, but the conversation is getting really heated. You can be a part of the conversation too through any digital platform, hashtag youth in industry. Marin, you had a burning point you wanted to bring in. Yeah, there was two points actually. I know we are here at CAM, which is manufacturing, but uh, skills in the TVET is also very relevant in crafts, or what we say here, juakali. Uh, so the juakali uh, trades have to be also skilled on an international level to uh, enable the economy to go and to help manufacturing. I mean, if you, if you have to install something in a building that is leaking windows or whatever, uh, that is also problematic for, for, for manufacturing. So to the youth, there's also a lot of uh, job opportunities in skilled uh, crafts and juakali. Mm -hmm. um, and one other aspect which is uh, quite important uh, from our experience is to enable the companies to properly train within the companies. And we call that train the trainers 
so there's some pedagogical skills that are that are passed on to the um, the instructors on site. So they are not afraid to pass on, or they don't just pass on, make the tea, or sweep the floor, or whatever, but really include the youth. And this is also from the first uh, two years or three years of courses we did here. We see a huge enthusiasm from the uh, employees of the companies to to do this and to learn this and to include the youth. So I mm -hmm. think that is also a very important step forward. Mm -hmm. Now, quick one. For those who've gone through the GIZ program, this dual certification, what does this mean when it comes to somebody going into the job market with dual certification where you're good enough in Kenya and you're good enough according to the German curriculum? It's a very good point. We are actually, with all these programs, educating for the Kenyan job market not to export the people to Germany or to others. But, as uh, Dr. Langat said before, we have a double certification, which is a Kenyan certification plus uh, a, a German one, which is uh, acknowledged by a lot of international companies, so they see this youth is able to follow uh, the requirements of Festo as a German company or a local. So um, it is... Uh, it is a double certification and assessment, but made for international competitiveness of the Kenyan work market. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, the sustainability of these innovations, they come up, they're great every single day, but there'll always be a problem. There's seed funding problem, there's skill problem, or there's just little market uptick. How do we solve this problem? Um, just to tie on what Marin was saying, the double certification, I think, will be critical for investment into the country because you see a lot of foreign investors looking to set up in the country and that assurance that we have the right skill set, I think, really encourages them to come into the market. Um, so in regards to innovation, innovation and uh, what we are doing with the world skills uh, is going to be quite critical because industry is very keen on innovation. Uh, we are constantly trying to innovate for the demands of the market, to reach global standards, to reach the African market and other things. So innovations are going to remain critical. And uh, why this competition is going to be important is we are going to really heighten the need for our youth, for young people to be innovative and also recognize that. Uh, what that does is that uh, it takes advantage of uh, the opportunities we've provided in industry because when these youth are in industry, when they are hands-on doing the job, uh, and going through the apprenticeship programs, they are able to see some gaps in industry that give room for innovation. And that way they are then innovating for a need in the industry or a need in the market. Because when you innovate towards a need, the chances of that innovation actually being taken up, the chances of that innovation being scaled up, increase significantly. So you won't have cases where you've innovated for the sake of innovation and it's sitting on a shelf. You're actually innovating to meet a gap in the market. So that's the importance of the program we are running because it gives the graduates an opportunity hands-on to see what's happening in industry, to see the industry needs that are being met by the industries that exist, but also to identify gaps. And for, uh, for young people who are entrepreneurial, who are innovative, they'll be able to then come up with innovative products that can meet those needs in the market. Langat, you want to come in? Yes, I, I think um, in, um, in, in a more general perspective, uh, one of the things also that we are looking at it as part of the reforms is the integration of entrepreneurship and gender into Tibet. And this is where we are trying to create an entrepreneurial mind from our students so that they don't only look at it in terms of training and going to look for a job, but to be able to innovate within that space that we've given them and come up with new ideas and um, uh, uh, products that will be able to partner with the big brothers in the industry and be able to support them to grow their products and become also big businesses in future. And what we are looking at it in terms of uh, how to, to, to implement this is that um, together with the industry, we are trying to create innovation uh, incubation centers in some of our Tibet institutions where both the industry mentors and our experts or trainers will be able to identify students' ideas that can be nurtured into businesses and be developed within that space. And uh, when these businesses grow and become viable, they are transferred from institution into uh, maybe chambers or association like um, and the rest. The other thing is that um, 
we are looking at, um, as we mentioned, a lot of businesses actually currently are in Joakali. Some of the products that we are using in our homes come from this institution. But you find that for a very long time, they continue producing the same product, no change in terms of either PRN or performance or anything that makes them very competitive. We're also trying to link our institution together with the Joakali so that they support through innovation and research that they can better some of these products and make them more competitive and probably more affordable and durable in terms of uh, accessing the market. And uh, lastly, we expect probably through this kind of arrangement that um, the big industry will be able to source uh, some of their uh, products that they will finish up uh, in terms of uh, either manufacturing or processing from these uh, uh, small businesses through outsourcing so that instead of importing everything, you can subcontract some of this. But the most critical thing, and I think that has been stopping this, is consistency. And then uh, in terms of producing this, uh, these products, the quality of these products, and the reliability in terms of consistent supply of what they want so that they can finish and sell it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, the discussion and collaboration that we want to have with the team in the industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Faith, I'll come to you briefly, but Sami, Taking from what Phyllis and Langat have said, this will need a paradigm shift in our education sector. You know, in, in Kenyan schools, most of the time you go to school, you finish <coughs> your time, and then you do your three months internship. If it has to be dual training, it has to mean you're in school, but you're working at the same time. Mm -hmm. How will that work? Uh, I believe it will work now that it has worked in, in Germany and those developed countries, but we need to, to start by changing our mindset at the moment. Because you realize that uh, from what we have been doing, we train, we, we just train without focusing on where do you want these graduates to be. When we started many years ago, it was possible. We were training very few and they would all be absorbed into the market to be retrained. But this time around, we are training so many without that focus. And I believe from now onwards, we will be able to, now that we are focused on, we want them to go to the industry. The industry has indicated to us what they, what they want, but we have to start from the basics by making sure that our, start with our trainers because a, a trainee is as good as the trainer. So we need to, to upgrade our trainers because the, most of them were trained many years ago in the skills that were there at that time. We don't have, a, we have not had a program where we keep upgrading our training for the trainers. And I believe that is one of the things that Tiveta is working on. We, we are working on a program of continuous professional development. Because if our trainers are not up to date with the, with the current technology, then they cannot pass it to the, to the trainees. But that is a program that is coming up. Our trainers have, um, have been sensitized. We all agree that we are not, we are not doing what is expected, and that, mind, that mindset change is already taking shape. Mm -hmm. So starting with our trainers, then we'll be able to impact our, our trainees. Mm -hmm. And that way we are going to make sure that, the, that we meet the needs of the industry and Kenya becomes what it is supposed to be. At the moment, we are still bogged down with the, with the old, old technology. But now we are, I believe, in the next one, two years, will be there. Mm -hmm. Well, 30 seconds, Faith, before I take a break, Langat mentioned contracting young people once they've been skilled, contract them, buy their goods or whatever services they're offering. Why is, it, why is this important for young people? Okay, first of all, uh, we know that uh, Kenya is among the youngest countries in the world with a median age of uh, 20, uh, 20 years. That means uh, we are our, the most populated uh, group is a very vibrant uh, group who are innovative and they've just completed trainings and or they are undergoing trainings. So focusing on uh, contracting the youth and, uh, uh, and uh, 
having buying their services and products encourages them to to work hard and also it improves the, their economic uh, standing and this also means stability for our country and also our economic development because if they are the most productive group it means if we really motivate and support their uh, ventures it means that um, all the all that they are going to produce will benefit our economy well, on that note, we want to take a short breather, but remember, you can still be a part of that conversation. Hashtag youth in industry across all digital platforms. We want to take a short breather. Stay with us. I'm Duncan Okelo Odiambo. I pursued a diploma course in mechanical engineering, industrial option. Uh, I graduated in 2014. The TVET I got through the college from my lecturers, they told me to apply. From college, they gave out our details, so I was only called by CAM to report to a training. When you Malaysia Shule, ni 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 different manufacturers wakatufu wakatufundisha jinsi ya ku interact na HRs kuandika CV interviews wakatufundisha paka kufikia hapa tulipo yote ni kwa BD ya kam Nasikia yani niko at least I, I have improved my skills mm. yenye nilikuwa nafanya class nilikuwa na deal mostly in theory but here I'm dealing practically. Now I'm going to change Welcome back to Come Live Session. My name is Ndiro Ganga, and today we are discussing technical skills for innovation. We've had a great chat, and we want to wind up this conversation. But before we do, a couple of things need to be cleared up. Langa, let's begin with you. Legislative framework to ensure that TVET institutions work in this country. What are some of those policies that we need to change? Well, I think uh, we started um, in the last uh, probably close to 10 years um, when we put in place a policy and legislative framework to realign our education to the new constitution. And we are very clear in terms of what a responsive education and training system, which we've mentioned um, uh, quality and relevant training, of course there are issues of uh, equity and access, and then again promoting TVET because by that time TVET was very low. And uh, currently we have been implementing the TVET Act 2013, and um, we have seen some of the things that have worked well and a few challenges which we are currently looking at reviewing. But one of the things that uh, probably that can address some of the questions that you raised, especially in terms of implementing dual training, where the industry provide a space for practical and uh, knowledge exchange. But when you look at the, um, the, the, the industry capacity in our country is still very low as compared to the number of uh, demands in training. But one, uh, one of the things that we have not exploded, and I think that should come through our legislative framework, is training through project. Because if you look at everywhere in this country, there are so many mega projects in transport, in agriculture, in energy and every sector. If we could make it a mandatory through some policies and legislative framework that every project, be it be public or private, 
has to integrate and infuse some of the skills development and technology transfer, and then a number of our institutions will be linked up with this project. And every time that project is being implemented, so many young people will be attached. And by the time the project, some of this project takes as long as three, four, five years, which is enough time to graduate someone with some uh, uh, qualification. And therefore, I think that should be the next focus. And we are going to discuss with other stakeholders, and especially those who are going to be in charge of our legislative framework in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sami, funding, which is very important. Mali allocates about 11% of their national budget to Tibet. Ghana, as low as 1%. Well, in Kenya, in a span of 10 years, we've seen allocations to Tibet grow from about 6 billion to 16 billion. Is this enough, and why must we fund Tibet institutions if they are to work? I would say that we have come from from quite far. And at the moment, I don't know about the percentages, but I think the funding in Kenya is, is quite huge. So that a TVET graduate can, can undertake a course at, um, where he contributes up to below 10%. The rest of it is funded by the government. And this is, uh, at the moment, the, our fees is fixed at uh, 56,420. The government gives a graduate, that a candidate or a student, 30,000 shillings. So the balance is 26,420. Then out of the 26,420, help avails 40,000 shillings. So the full cost of training is covered, meaning would argue, not like the politicians, that our TV training is free, but then that bit is the tuition is covered, a hundred percent, and a student is even given some out of pocket to a tune of thirteen thousand five hundred and and something. So, in terms of funding, we are we are very good. The problem is that uh, there is there are still those other few costs like the like the boarding boarding expenses which may be a challenge because our, our Tibet institutions are located mainly in urban areas, especially the main ones. There is a, there is a shift such that uh, new institutions are being constructed closer and closer to the, to the population. But I would want to say that uh, we, are, we are doing very well in terms of funding. Maybe out of that question is how come, even with our education, our TV training being almost free, that we, we still have a shortage of trainees. So that if you go to our new institutions, many of them are actually empty. Uh, that is a question we need, to, we need to answer. And I think part of it is, has to do with perception. That uh, there is still a feeling, I believe even amongst us, it is still there, that TV training is for is for failures, which is not the case. The DG has talked of graduates who are opting to go for to go for Tibet, much as they have qualified to go to, to the university, which in, in terms of a Kenyan youth, that is the ultimate destination. But a lot is being done again, and I want to say in terms of branding and changing the perception. Besides the funding and all the other measures that we are taking, we have undertaken a lot of physical infrastructure improvement. Because the first thing a graduate sees or a potential school leaver sees is the face of the institution. Our institutions have looked so dilapidated so that a person coming from a, a national school, for example, would not wish to go to a technical institution because it looks like a smaller, much as we talk of higher institution of higher learning, it looks as more institution in terms of infrastructure. And for you to go in and realize that there is free, there is funding, there is quality training, you, the first thing that attracts you is the, is the physical infrastructure, which we are working on. And I would want to say that during the COVID, the COVID period, and uh, with the enforcement of our CS, a lot has, a lot has happened. The institutions that were there in March are totally different in terms of looks. And I believe that one will, will make us more attractive. They'll make our students go for that funding. 
and maybe after that we'll have so many people interested in Tibet that we may talk of increasing the funding. But the funding that is there at the moment, I believe, is, is fairly sufficient. But then it means there are so many graduates, potential graduates who are outside there and not accessing this training. Mm -hmm. Faith, let me bring you in because Sami raises an issue that needs to be addressed. Many people do not think that it's worthy to go to a Tibet institution. As a member of World Skills Council Kenya, I want you to take a minute and talk to the person who might be watching. What are some of those success stories? Just pick one of somebody you know from the council who went to a Tibet institution and these skills are serving them really well currently in this modern day and age. So people can see that a Tibet institution is just as worthy as a university. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that question. Maybe I will, I will talk of one success story. Maybe a colleague, even uh, I can talk of a colleague in South Africa. Uh, he participated in the, these uh, competitions, at his work, his competitions, and he really uh, was excellent in mechatronics. And when he uh, came out of the, 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 the work, his, uh, uh, competitions and finished uh, his uh, TVET training, he was taken in by uh, our uh, first headquarters in South Africa and is now the expert in mechatronics. And he has never done any university degree, only uh, uh, TVET training. So what I think about TVET is that if we take it passionately and believe in what we are doing, we can get excellent at the skill we have or at the skill we acquire. And uh, as we now go into learning from other countries and uh, getting to exchange with others, we really become, uh, we increase our workmanship and this will really pay off in the industry. So I really encourage the youth to view Tibet in a very positive light. Mm -hmm. Maren, 1950 to date as members of the World uh, Skills International, what are some of the gains that Germany has made? We are regarded as one of the top TVET and top manufacturing uh, uh, countries. Uh, that, of course, also has been um, assisted by World Skills and by the competition and the pride. Um, also, uh, as, a, as an expert living here, um, I complain about bad fundis. Yeah? We, and then people say, oh, well, we'd like to have the German quality fundis here. Yes, that has also developed through um, the, the TVET programs and also the competition. And especially a lot of the, both industrial and other jobs, they at the moment, uh, on the world level, they combine tradition and innovation, which is very important. So um, I think uh, uh, our image and our, our export and investment success uh, are uh, some of the, some of the um, uh, gains we got. And... In Germany, you can find people who are very proud to have gone the TVET way. And not, um, here we still say, has not even gone to university. They sometimes do much better careers. We have CEOs who have never studied. And in general, on, on the work level, um, I have to admit, I didn't do TVET. I'm, I'm a lawyer. But when I finished, my, my colleagues from high school who went to TVET, the first 10 years earned more than I, I did. Huh? So um, that is a perception that is wrong here, that TVET is low. If you have good quality and you can make further learning, and uh, also in the, in the um, KNQA um, um, system here, you can add qualifications. So it is really a part. So this pride I want to see here uh, more. And uh, we have some success stories uh, of course, the whole system is only starting in the last five years in practical uh, uh, installation, so we don't have that many to, to show, but it is there, and we have these pride grins of graduates uh, that we had at KTTC, we had at, at Cronus, we had, we will have soon in, in KTDC. They are pride to have graduated from a mm -hmm. Phyllis, as we wind up, where do we go from here, particularly you as an industry player in the manufacturing sector, and what incentives do we need to put in place to ensure that uh, employers are open enough 
to take in these youngings, train with them along their educational journey, and still be willing to employ them without the university degree. Um, thank you, thank you very much. As come, uh, this is a journey we've started. Uh, you've heard Marian speak about the 1950s. Uh, so the role we want to play is to really ensure that we act as the link uh, between industry and the different players, the development partners, the TTIs, Tiveta, the ministry, and everyone else, so that we accelerate this. I don't think we have 60 years to wait because our youth are a bulging population and we need to find the solutions now. So we need to play the role to accelerate how quickly we can develop skills we need to accelerate how quickly we change the perceptions in the market uh, and also work on the policies that will encourage industry uh, to be able to take up more graduates. Um, at the heart of it is the competitiveness of the manufacturing sector uh, because if we are competitive and we are growing, we are also able to expand enough to be able to absorb more youth. So the role CAM is going to play is to act as really the essential link in this dialogue uh, to also be on the ground to ensure things are happening. We're implementing uh, our current project uh, in partnership with GIZ, working very closely with the TTIs and, and, the, and the entire sector. So all the policy reform required incentives so that industries are able to take up as many graduates as possible, are able to give of their time also in skills development, because clearly there's a lot of time and skills required to get this done, and also even provide a platform for what uh, we spoke about of the training of trainers, what uh, Sami spoke about, because a lot of them will need to access industry, see what is currently uh, happening at industry to be able to take this to the next level. Mm -hmm. So we continue to do that and also offer platforms through the skills development, but also our SME hub. Uh, there's a big part that uh, Langat spoke about of the entrepreneurship, uh, because this skills development, yes, we want to have people employed in jobs, but we also want to see entrepreneurs created. So the innovation that's coming out of the work that is happening, we have an SME hub to really incubate manufacturing SMEs uh, so that we see how we grow those skills. And now Women in Manufacturing Program also working to ensure that we see more women uh, get involved in the TVET space and take up these opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to playing that role going forward. Thank you. Great. Now, 30 seconds on the clock. There are one, two, three, four, five. So that will be about uh, two minutes, 30 seconds your parting shot. Let's begin with you, Faith. Waskis is going to shape the skills development in our country, and especially our youth are going to be the greatest beneficiaries. I want to see Olympic champions, participants from Kenya. It's not about winning, it's about being there, and I want the pride of Kenya being at the next World Skills International after the national and see how they do. It's on two things. One is looking at the sustainable funding. We have to look at how we bring in industry to contribute and complement government. And second is that we are providing a, a pathway for those who want to go to Tibet and still believe that they want to all the way to the university. We are giving opportunities within the technical universities. Um, as come, we speak a lot about the issue of being globally competitive, and I think World Skills gives us that platform to ensure that we are globally competitive in terms of the skills in the market. So we look forward to partnering and working to uh, take this forward. Thank you. Uh, very huge potential in our youths, especially given the right incentives. A good example is what we did in our institutions when COVID came. Most of our institutions were able to, to manufacture their own hand and soap, hand as soap, and soap dispensers, and also the chemicals themselves, so that many of our institutions are not buying the sanitizers. They are also not buying the, the liquid detergents. We are able to do that. And that was just uh, in a span of one or two months. So there is a very huge potential. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, in the African spirit, we have to sneak in one last one there. Mm -hmm. On the 24th of January, we'll be celebrating the UN World Education Day. Langat, how can we improve the quality of our education in this country? Higher level, TTI, TVS. It is just Okay, in, we just do the right thing. Uh, in terms of policies, bringing in the, the stakeholders to work together and always aspire to uh, match the 
international competitiveness in terms of education and training. Sami? Uh, I think we are, we'll be showcasing what we have at the moment and we are, we are good. And uh, I want to say that uh, we have started on a long journey, but we'll be there. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, last word. Um, my last word is that industry is committed to be part of this journey. We know that it is something that will create opportunities for our youth, but also make us uh, able to expand our markets uh, globally and, and within the African region. So we are very keen to work with all the partners, the development partners, the government stakeholders, to make this happen, uh, because we see a lot of opportunity for us to be able to create jobs uh, for our youth to take advantage of uh, the expertise, the innovation, the creativity of, of the youth population in Kenya. So, yeah, looking forward to a successful 2021 uh, around world skills and all the work we'll be doing on skills development mm -hmm. as Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Marin, if you're kind enough, wrap it up for us from a gro global perspective. Well, that's a challenge. Um, no, from a, from a German uh, uh, perspective here in Kenya, I think... TVET, World Skills, all these initiatives really will help Kenya to be internationally competitive and interesting for international investors because we need the skilled workforce and we need, as uh, Faith has also said, we also need the peace and the stability in the country that comes from employed youth. So all this together, I think, will bring Kenya higher on the international map. Thank you all. Thank you for making time. Now, before we wind up, think about the uh, probably Asia, Middle East Asia. They are known as the Asian Tigers. And do you know why? It's because 50% of their educational recruits are recruited in Tibet institutions vis-a-vis -vis universities and colleges. It is this way that they've been able to grow from low-income societies to middle-income societies to high income societies. If Kenya is to move from a low middle income society to a middle middle, then manufacturing might be one of the ways to go. And how do we do that? By having skill based labor. If Tibet is not the way, I don't know which other way is. Have a good day. Throughout the years, we as manufacturers have been constantly decrying on the skills level and the skill sets of most of the students coming out of our technical institutions. I have been working in the industry, and I have been working with the students in the industry. I have been working with opportunity to interact with the machine. In terms of uh, working with the, uh, the institutions working with the industries, it is uh, very essential that uh, they uh, there is a provision in the curriculum uh, so that uh, at uh, frequent intervals the uh, trainees are uh, exposed to the industry. Uh, potentially we'll talk of uh, maybe three months for every year, year of training so that uh, these uh, trainees are able to actualize what they have learned in, in class and they are able now to get up to, up to pace. We have realized that skills have to, uh, to match with the needs of the industry. And uh, as Nakuru, we have uh, partnered with several partners to make sure that the skills we are training are uh, in tandem with the market. If we want to produce a technician, then we should go to the industry and ask from the specialist technicians. I believe that uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers can be able to retool the training manuals in our Tibet institutions so that they can bring an aspect of practicability, how we can train for a purpose of solving a problem. We are walking the talk because we are integrating these skills that are required in the industry into the curriculum. This collaboration with the industry is extremely important when it comes to our programs and our courses. So far, it has been very, very good and um, the CAM has really helped us. We need to think about like the German model and I think also the Korean model they've, they've used where they've industrialized, where you understand it is actually a lot of manual technical skills that count and a little bit less than theoretical and uh, the desk job things.
I think government has to put its foot down through the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Labor in what is required by the institutions they are already empowering to uh, train on skill. They need to redesign every institution's mandate and role.